dad now. Uh, no, don't even, don't, don't, don't. I mean, the, just the environmental impact of having those children is, <laughs> it's horrible. I'm a dad, so my life uh, finally caught up with my looks. <laughs> just been looking like a dad for 40 years. <laughs> Without kids, honestly, it was getting creepy, you know? <laughs> People were like, that dad seems too drunk. <laughs> now it's like, hey, that dad is too drunk. <laughs> my, uh, my daughter calls me Papa. Yeah. Because we, as a society, ruin daddy. <laughs> Nobody's ever said, choke me, papa. <laughs> Maybe Barbara Streisand. <laughs> so now my daughter has to refer to me like we live in a French fishing village in the 20s. <laughs> like, will we eat today, papa? <laughs> I don't rightly know, daughter. <laughs> But it's been a little tough um, at home uh, because I live with an anti-vaxxer. Yeah, my four-year-old. <laughs> and I thought it was just because she didn't like needles, you know? But then I saw her like drawing this picture and I was like, what is this, honey? She's like, oh, this? This is just Bill Gates trying to inject his microchip into me, daddy. And I was like, all right, that's it. We're taking a bath. And she's like, 666 is the number of the beast. The vaccine was created by a supercomputer in Belgium. I'm like, all right, no more YouTube. And she's like, go get poked, you cuck. <laughs> like, no more Joe Rogan experience for you. <laughs> it was a mistake to subscribe you. I have, I have two, I have two children, uh, and like two is, oh man, it's, uh, it's more than one, and <laughs> there's so much more than one, and I don't, I just, I don't know if I like who I am with two children, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like recently, at the dinner table, I screamed at my entire family, I don't care if everyone's crying, I'm eating. <laughs> to be that man. I legitimately whispered under my breath to a one-year-old, oh, you're such a fucking baby. <laughs> no, no. And man, when I had one kid, I was so cocky about it. You know, if like someone was like, hey man, we're thinking about having a kid, should we? I'd be like, hey, is it hard? Yeah. <laughs> but what that's worth doing isn't hard. <laughs> and then if someone's like, hey man, should we have a second kid? I'm like, don't talk. To me, I have 15 minutes to drink this vodka soda before going to bed because every minute that he sleeps, that I don't sleep, he gets stronger than me. <laughs> I want to be a good dad. You know, I want to be, I mean, most dads want to be good dads except for those pieces of shit, you know? <laughs> I want to be a good dad, so I got a vasectomy, uh, like, right away. <laughs> I was like, no more me! Um, the vasectomy was weird. Uh, I was hard the whole time. 
and the doctor was like, what's going on, man? And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, doc, if I'm excited to relieve my wife of the responsibility of birth control for the rest of her life. So just grab onto this shaft and neuter the patriarchy, bro. And he's like, you don't know how this works, do you? I was like, I do not, I do not. <laughs> no, but I, I do, I wanna be a good dad. I don't necessarily have like a great blueprint for a good dad. Like my dad, my dad's a, uh, he's like a guy, you know? <laughs> Here, I'll tell you a story. Like recently my brother called me and he's like, hey, I'm with dad. Dad wants to know, are you on a CarMax commercial? And I was like, no, I'm not in a CarMax commercial. And then I hear him go, no, he's not in a CarMax commercial. And then in the background, I hear my dad go, yes, he is! <laughs> so in case you haven't seen this CarMax commercial, very funny comedian. The similarities between us are that we have glasses and are white, and that is it. And so what's nice is that my dad insisted my brother give me a call just to let me know he has no idea what I look or sound like. <laughs> Which would be weird for most dads. Um, but my dad has uh, eight children from many different women, because my dad loves to fuck, hates wearing a condom, <laughs> which is a weird irresponsibility that results in so much more responsibility. <laughs> so my, my eldest sister is 60 years old, and my youngest two sisters are 19. <laughs> right at the end. Go fuck yourself, Dad. <laughs> Twins at 62. Bam, bam. Twins at 62. I think that's a Rod Stewart song, actually. <laughs> so that means that my dad has been a dad every day for 60 years, and he's never gotten any better at it? <laughs> like, that's amazing. If you did anything every day for 60 years, you would accidentally become a genius at doing that thing. And my dad has never become better at being a dad? <laughs> that's amazing. My dad is like a guy who played mini golf every day for 60 years. And then one day someone was like, oh look, it's a golf ball. And my dad was like, that's a bowling ball. <laughs> First was like, no, that's not a bowling ball. And my dad's like, yes, it is. <laughs> that is the equivalent of not recognizing your own son on a goddamn commercial. <laughs> Memorize our faces, Father. <laughs> it is the literal least you could do. <laughs> so, eldest sister, 60, youngest two sisters are 19, which means I have multiple nieces and nephews that are way older than my youngest two sisters. So, last time we all got together, about 17 years ago, because we don't do it too often, because it's too weird for everybody. <laughs> it's just like a bunch of employees from regional offices getting together for a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> my eldest nephew, at the time he was 18, hanging out with my youngest two sisters at the time were two. One of them shit their pants. <laughs> he wanted to tell my dad, so he said, Grandpa, I believe Emily has pooped her pants. Luckily, I was there to correct him. And I said, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. you believe Aunt Emily has pooped her pants. <laughs> and my dad was like, that's not funny, don't do that. And I was like, I wish you knew how very funny that is, Papa. 
perhaps it would give you a perspective on your whimsical life so far. <laughs> So, my parents got divorced when I was two. I grew up in Jersey. What up, Jersey? I'm required by law to say that. And uh, my dad lived in Michigan. So, <laughs> I don't like your state. So, <laughs> it's fine. It's a fine state. <laughs> I have personal resentment towards the state itself, okay? <laughs> but my dad decided that when I was five years old, he just, he just decreed like a drunk king, the boy is old enough to fly on the aeroplane by himself. <laughs> and so I started flying uh, by myself at age five. And in case you've never done that, here's how it goes. Uh, your mom drops you off at the airport, and then <laughs> drives away. <laughs> and then a flight attendant who is psyched to in addition to doing her weird job that's midway between being a cocktail waitress and a first responder, <laughs> now also has to babysit a five-year-old? <laughs> and the very first thing they do is they give you a sticker, it says unaccompanied minor. <laughs> Just to make sure everybody at the airport knows you're there for the taking. <laughs> Just like a little silver platter for pedophiles. Like, this one's alone, boys. <laughs> this is Kurt. He's five. He loves He-Man and sharks and keeping secrets. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, there's no way they still do that. That was just something they did in the 80s. <laughs> no, they still do. <laughs> I was recently in Montreal airport. I saw a little girl, she must have been 10 years old. She had the unaccompanied minor sticker on, but then she was also wearing a t-shirt. And I am assuming that her parents do not speak English because the t-shirt just said, white wine all the time. <laughs> Which combined with the unaccompanied minor sticker, not a good look for the parents. <laughs> and for some reason, every flight I ever took had a three hour layover in Dayton, Ohio. And I hated it. I hated it so much as a kid uh, until I turned 12 and I learned the secrets of Dayton, Ohio. And in order to understand the secret of Dayton, Ohio, uh, you need to know three true things about myself, Kurt Brownler. Fact number one, <laughs> I started smoking cigarettes at age 10. <laughs> what up, Jersey? <laughs> 10! Fact number two, I discovered pornography at age 12 when I found all of my uncle's playboys and cut just the breasts out of every photograph <laughs> and taped them to my wall, <laughs> hidden underneath a poster that was a photograph of myself at age five that said, wanted, dead or alive. <laughs> and I would charge children in the neighborhood a quarter to stare at this sea of disembodied breasts. <laughs> Realizing early on that breasts with that women are very upsetting. <laughs> it was just a pile of sunny side up eggs. <laughs> and fact number three, I hate the saxophone, okay? That has nothing to do with this story, just a little something about me. So, when I turned 12, I learned the secret of Dayton, Ohio, which was this. I would get off the plane in Dayton, shake, my flight attendant guard, and then I would head off into the airport, because you could do this, because it was the 80s. I would buy cigarettes and pornography and sit in the Dayton airport for three hours smoking Marlboro Reds and flipping through a hustler like some sort of 12-year-old divorced dad, which is very ironic, because that's who put me in this position in the first place. The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. But I want to be a good dad. 
I don't want my daughter to have her own date in Ohio, you know? <laughs> and I think part of being a good dad is also like being a good man. And, uh, but uh, you know, I fail every once in a while. I'll tell you the story. There is a, there's a gas station near my house, has a little handwritten sign on one of the pumps that says, please. Replace nozzle to pump before driving away with it. Thanks! <laughs> and like years ago, I took a photograph of this and I posted it to Instagram and me and a bunch of strangers made fun of all these human trash piles who were just driving away with the pump still in their goddamn car. Uh, and so when I drove away with the pump in my car about a year ago, I was bashful. Have you ever made fun of yourself from the past with a bunch of strangers? Because I have. <laughs> and the thing is, I didn't even know I did it. I had no idea. Yeah, I hopped in the car, blasted my meditation app, and just took off, <laughs> ripped it right out of the pump, had no idea, and then immediately pulled an illegal four-lane U-turn. <laughs> And all of the oncoming traffic was like, bah, 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 bah. and I was like, oh, fuck you, you fucking church Nancys. It's a U-turn. <laughs> so I gave him all the middle finger. <laughs> Meanwhile, spewing gasoline across the street. <laughs> and then I made a right and, and I got on like a big highway, started going very fast. And mind you, I just have a tail, like, dragging behind me, like, -da 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 -da. <laughs> and then this big white pickup truck pulls up next to me, and he's honking at me, and I was like, what? It's a U-turn! <laughs> and he's like, roll your window down. And I was like, what? And he's like, you drove away with the pump in your car. And I was like, oh, you drove away with the pump in your car. Oh, no! So I did. <laughs> so I did. And then I was very, very, very embarrassed. And I'm on the highway, I didn't know what to do. So then I just like pulled over to the side of the road and then he pulled over too. And then like I got out of my car and then he got out of his car too. I was like deeply embarrassed. You know, it's essentially like I shit my pants and then he like followed me into the bathroom like, <laughs> Hey, man, do you shit your pants? <laughs> hey, how much shit is in your pants? <laughs> hey, why do you think you shit your pants earlier? <laughs> and I was just like, what, what do you want? And he's like, do you need help? <laughs> and I realized, like, I had a choice to make here, you know? I could act the way men have acted for centuries. I could act like a wounded animal and lash out at this man to protect myself. Or I could be a better man. I could admit my vulnerabilities and say, yes, I screwed up and I do need help. <laughs> and so that man said, hey, can I help you? And I said to him, no! <laughs> and then he got mad and got in his car and drove away. And then I was left alone with my shame. <laughs> and I like walked over to the back of my car. I pulled out the gas pump and I was like, oh, there's definitely still a lot of gas in here, you know? It's like, I can't put it in my car. Is it fumes and stuff? I'm picking up my daughter. What would be very useful right now is a, a pickup truck, but I just told that guy to go fuck himself. <laughs> So then I just left my car on the side of the road and then walked with it in my arms all the way back along the highway, down the exit ramp, back to the gas station where both managers were waiting for me outside. <laughs> and I just kind of laid it at their feet like a big dead snake. And I was like, well, what do we do now? Turns out it cost $350, which is Honestly, a lot less than I expected. <laughs> I mean, you don't get to keep it, but, uh, <laughs> but also they're like designed to just pop right off. So the thing is, is like, just do it. It doesn't matter. Just do it. <laughs> also, if you turn it into a comedy bit, it kind of pays for itself. <laughs> Thank you.
And you know, like when I, when you, when you have a kid, you just like, you just stay inside for a very long time. And I think we're all very familiar with how that feels. <laughs> and it, recently it was like the first time I had been out since my son had been born. The first time I was in society, I was in an airport. And uh, I knew it was gonna be weird like reintegrating into society, but I didn't know in what ways it would be. And this kind of surprised me. I was in a public bathroom, huge airport bathroom, and the urinals were like where the stool was. And I was across the room around here. And it was at this point that I realized, oh no, I've taken my penis out too soon. <laughs> I was like, oh no. And all the men around me were like, too soon. And I was like, I know! And they're like, put it back! And I'm like, there's no time! <laughs> I did home behavior outside. <laughs> At home, you see the toilet, you're like, nah, I'm ready to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, so I just stay home, mostly. I just stay home. <laughs> My daughter... After she was born, like, there was just, like, nothing in her room. It just kind of seemed like uh, we had, like, a house guest for a little while. <laughs> and so I was always trying to look for things that I could, like, make her room look like a little girl's room. And, uh, guys, comedy has uh, treated me pretty well, you know? I mean, I'm not a rich man by any stretch of the imagination, but I can definitely go to a small town and afford any number of vintage dog photographs they have, you know? <laughs> And so I was in Burlington, Vermont, <laughs> drunk. Because what else are you going to do in Burlington? <laughs> Just watch white people be happy? <laughs> Guys, if you've never been to Burlington, fun town. Founded in 1990 when a fish concert collided with the zip line convention. <laughs> Just a little town of like-minded Tiva sandals in the middle of a forest with a massive methamphetamine problem. <laughs> Definitely go in the fall when they harvest the blueberry marshmallow vape. It's delicious. <laughs> so I was there, two in the morning, drunk in a snowstorm, and I saw a piece of art in a window that stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a photograph of a dog an old-timey saloon playing the piano <laughs> with a little handkerchief around his neck like he was some little bandito that just happened to ride into what I'm assuming is an all-dog Wild West town, <laughs> probably on the back of a larger version of himself, then saw the bar, hopped off the dog, kicked open the doors, hopped in, had a shot of fire water, saw the piano, hopped up to tickle the old ivories, and the only newspaper dog in town was there at the perfect moment to snap a perfect photo. It's a goddamn piece of art. <laughs> And I was like, my daughter needs this. <laughs> so I went to bed, woke up the next morning, found the store. What the store is, turns out. It's a place where you can get dressed up in old-timey Wild West gear and get your picture taken in an old-timey saloon, which makes no sense for Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> like it would, it's not in the Wild West, guys. It would make more sense if you could get dressed up as Bernie Sanders and eat some Ben and Jerry's, but whatever. <laughs> That guy had a dream, he made a weird store, all right? <laughs> so I go in and I say, I love this uh, photograph, this dog playing the piano. And the guy there, he's like, I took that photo. And I'm like, you're an artist. And he's like, do you want to know something about that? And I'm like, I do. He said, that dog wasn't actually playing the piano. <laughs> It's worth so much more to me now <laughs> that he thought I was just walking by and saw the photo and was like, he has photographic proof of dogs playing the piano! I gotta show this to the scientists, man! So I was like, that's amazing. I would love to buy it for my daughter. He gets very serious. He's like, oh, this photo's not for sale. This was a client. I took this photograph of a client's dog. Also, it's an heirloom frame from my wife's family. I could never part with it. And then in my head, I was like, oh no. If I don't get this for my daughter, I'm a bad dad, aren't I? And then I was like, maybe I should offer him more than I think it's worth. And, but the thing is, I don't know what things are worth. 
And I was like, should I offer him $100? Like, is this worth like a, a third of a gas pump? I don't know. <laughs> and so then I panicked and I was just like, I'll give you a hundred bucks. And he just went, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I realized I had far overvalued <laughs> the piano playing dog photo market in Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> And he immediately sold it to me, heirloom frame and all. <laughs> and I realized that at that time, I had become the bad guy in every 80s movie ever. <laughs> Just like walking into a small town with my douchebag LA money, like, oh, is it not for sale, old man? Well, now it is. <laughs> but now I'm telling this story to you because I want if you're ever in Burlington, Vermont, I want you to find that store. I want you to go in there. I want you to offer that man $100 for any dog playing piano photographs he might have. Because what I want to do is I want to artificially inflate the market for dog playing piano photography <laughs> in the small economy that is Burlington, Vermont, till it's no longer known for like hippies and hacky sacks, but mostly anthropomorphic dog photography. Because <laughs> we can do that because that's how capitalism works. I've been thinking a lot about capitalism recently. I think we all have, now that these uh, jack-offs have been going to space on their lunch break or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was like, what is the definition of capitalism? We always talk about it, so I looked it up online. The definition is, if every individual acts in their own rational self-interest, that will bring about the most good for the most amount of people. And I was like, <gasps> the flaw is in the definition! <laughs> Human beings aren't rational. Fucking Smash Mouth is still popular, guys. We don't make rational choices, we make emotional choices. That's why billionaires exist. Billionaires are not rational. They make no rational sense. They have more money than they could ever spend in their entire life. And also, now in America, three people have more money than the bottom half of Americans. That's three people who have more money than 162 million individuals. That seems insane to me. But also, I don't know, maybe capitalism is the best system. I don't know, I'm not a uh, uh, systems uh, guy, you know? <laughs> But I do know that in this country, we have a show called Hoarders, where if an old lady has like 25,000 magazines, we're like, kick her door down. We're like, you can't have these magazines. She's like, no, let me have the magazines. We're like, no, you can't have these magazines. We're gonna burn your house down. Anyway, I'm pitching Hoarders 2, where we just murder billionaires. <laughs> It is weird to like be raising children in America right now. Cause like America's, you know, we're not nailing it right now. <laughs> you know? There was a thing I read recently that was, there was a woman in Decatur, Georgia. Uh, she heard some buzzing. You're gonna love this one then. <laughs> she had 120,000 bees living in her ceiling. This is true, you can Google it later. Just put in 120,000 and B, it'll autocorrect bees. And <laughs> I don't know about you guys, Denver, but I feel like if I see five bees, <laughs> I'm like, there's a lot of bees here. <laughs> we should do something about our bee problem. But you know, fuck me, maybe I'm some liberal coastal elite motherfucker who notices bees, you know? <laughs> well, let's say 10,000 bees. Wow, 10,000 bees coming and going from your house, doing what they do, eating leaves and shit. I don't know much about bees' lives or what they eat. That definitely seems like enough bees to be like, bees, no? 20,000 bees. That's two times 10,000 bees, which already seemed like a lot to me. No? 30,000 bees? I talked to a bee person, 30,000 bees is nine pounds of bees. That's a healthy baby boy of bees. Definitely seems like enough bees to be like, we have bees here, no? 
thousand bees. That is a golden doodle of bees. <laughs> woof, woof, there are bees here. No, we're not noticing them yet. 50,000 bees, 50,000 bees. That's Dodger Stadium of bees. Each bee has its own seat. Adorable, but a lot of bees. Empirically, a lot of bees. What, 60,000? What are you talking about, 60,000 bees and we haven't noticed them? That's a Nissan Juke filled with bees. And they're packed in tight. They're holding each other, tip to tail, tip to tail. They could drive the thing if they could figure it out, but they can't because they're bees. Mary, a peep from this woman at 60,000 bees. It takes two Nissan Jukes filled with bees before this woman is like, there appear to be bees here. <laughs> and that's America, guys. Let's reset. So, if I didn't have like a great blueprint for being a dad from my dad, like my mom was the opposite. My mom was an amazing mom, single parent. First of all, give it up for single parents, man. I don't know how you do it. Like there's two of us and my wife and I are in a constant murder-suicide pact with each other, just taking care of the children. My mom was a pediatric nurse and uh, and so if she didn't have anybody to like watch me on the weekend, she would just like bring me uh, to, you know, to work with her. You know, it was a pediatric floor. There was a lot of kids there that I would make friends with and then they would eventually die over and over and over and over and over again. Um, that was my life. And, and all the other nurses were like psyched that like, you know, Barbara's kid is here. So they'd always give me jobs to do. My main job was delivering blood to the lab. <laughs> which breaks my mind now. Like now, in order to touch blood in a hospital, you have to be in like a space suit, you know? They just like, I was just like six years old and they just handed me a hot bag of blood. And I was like, I'm on an adventure. I get to take the elevator, that was very exciting. And then I would just like walk around the basement looking for the lab and get lost eventually and then just like knock on a door and hand someone the blood and they'd be like, what is this? Who are you? I'm like, sorry, can't talk to strangers and like run away. <laughs> a lot of misdiagnoses at that hospital. <laughs> so, and my mom was all about, she was all about like unconditional love. Like that was her whole thing, was unconditional love. And she would always read me this book uh, called The Giving Tree. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful book. I read it to my daughter now. Uh, if you have never read it, it's about uh, a tree that gives everything for this little boy. Reading it as a parent, it reads a little different. <laughs> definitely reads like a piece of shit boy who murders a tree and then sits on it with his bony balls and ass after it's dead. <laughs> but it is, it's, it's a beautiful book. It is, a, I, I tear up when I read it. And I wanted to talk about this in my special and I wanted to show it to you guys. However, Harper Collins has refused me permission to use the images of the giving tree, but that's okay guys, because I've got the sharing bush here. <laughs> And when you read The Giving Tree, it is, you're just like, you're, you're touched. You're like, what gorgeous soul wrote such a beautiful book? And then you flip it around. There he is. <laughs> Old Shel Silverstein himself. Again, Harper Collins refused me the rights to Shel Silverstein's image. So this is noted serial killer and cannibal, Otis Toole. <laughs> However, 
Shel Silverstein's author photo and this photo have a really similar vibe. <laughs> With the only difference being Shel's photo is a bit more sexual. <laughs> and it is this size. <laughs> it's the full back cover. And you know when this was written, <laughs> Shell was to like to the publisher, hey, I want to have an author's photo. And they're like, Shell, it's a children's book. <laughs> and he's like, I insist. They're like, okay, well, well, we can put like an inch by inch photo on the inside flap, you know? And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Full back cover. <laughs> I need you guys to Google this actual photo. Because it is the cover of a book that should be called Shell Silverstein, Fuck Pirate. <laughs> and at this point in the joke, I am pretty sure Harper Collins would have preferred to give me the rights <laughs> than to have noted serial killer and cannibal Otis Toole. Be cool with your intellectual property, guys. <laughs> mm. I've I really have never drank an, an entire pint glass of water at a show. This place is a fucking desert. Um, so, about... Um, about five years ago, I moved back to New Jersey to uh, take care of my mom because she got sick. And uh, obviously, when a parent gets cancer, that's always sad, uh, unless it's a hilarious cancer. And uh, I checked, and there are none. Um, <laughs> and that's tough, because there's butt and ball cancer. Like, one of them should be hilarious. <laughs> and they're not. <laughs> so I moved back to Jersey. And, uh, and it's weird, you know, like, when your personal life is falling apart, like, normal life just, like, keeps on moving. And uh, I was back taking care of my mom, and I, and I got an audition in New York for a sitcom. And I was like, oh, I guess I got to go do this audition, you know? So I go up to the city, and I prep the scene. And the scene had kind of an emotional moment to it. I was like, oh, this will be interesting to play. And I get in the room with the casting person, and I'm doing the scene. And as I'm doing it, I'm like, I'm feeling it, you know? I'm like, oh, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. And then all of a sudden I feel at the emotional moment in the scene like a tear roll down my face and I'm like, am I fucking crying in an audition? I'm nailing this! And I was like, am I Al Pacino and I didn't know it? And I finish the scene and I like wipe the tears away and I look at the casting person and the casting person just goes, oh, so sick! I swear to God, it was like I auditioned for uh, the cartoon version of a 12-year-old bully, do you know? <laughs> and I told my friend that story, and he's like, oh, man, I got to take you out. Like, you got to get your mind off this. And so he brought me out. He was playing with one of my favorite bands, Dinosaur Jr. And... <laughs> I love Dinosaur Jr. so much. And so we got to go, like, backstage to, like, the green room at this, like, rock show, you know? And, like, uh, the, the green room of a rock show is a very small, intimate party, you know? And I'm very uncomfortable at small, intimate parties. Uh, I prefer the anonymity of a large party, which is a paraphrase from The Great Gatsby, so you know this is going to be a little bit pretentious. And... <laughs> But also, like, I was very nervous because I wasn't supposed to be there. I'm not on the show. I'm just there. And it's just filled with, like, 90s rock legends. I, I was just like, well, I have to explain to people why I'm here. I didn't. I didn't at all. And, like, Henry Rollins was there, and I, like, marched up to Henry Rollins, and I was like, hi, Henry. I'm, I'm Kurt. I'm a comedian. He was like, you're very intense. And I was just like, I got it. And I, like, ran into Tony Hawk and Tony Hawk, and I was just like, ah, comedian. And, like, ran away. And then Mike Watt was in this room, and Mike Watt was in this band, The Minutemen, and I love The Minutemen, and I was just so nervous, yeah. 
I was just so nervous to like be in the same room with him that I was like, I can't, I can't, I gotta get out of here. And I like went down to watch the show. But you know, when you're backstage at a rock show, it's open bar. You know, and I am very good slash very bad at open bars, depending on your opinion of things. Uh, so I'll tell you a story to explain. When I was eight years old, we were out of the house for about nine hours, and my cat knocked a five pound bag of powdered sugar onto the ground, and then my 10 pound poodle, Doogie Bowser K9, <laughs> proceeded to eat all five pounds of powdered sugar. <laughs> and I can only imagine his day <laughs> where manna falls from the heavens. <laughs> he gets into it. Mm, it goes down easy. It's powdered sugar. <laughs> but after a pound and a half, I'm sure he was like, hoo, 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 hoo. and I'm not feeling too good. <laughs> But something in his little doggy mind was like, but when is this gonna happen again? Let's get back in there. Let's finish all five pounds of powdered sugar. He did, he was sick for three days. He shit and puked all the time. That is exactly how I am at an open bar. putting a few back, I'm watching the show, and for like 10 minutes, it's perfect. I'm watching Dinosaur Jr., and I'm fully present, and everything that's going on with my life falls away. I'm not thinking about the fact that my mom is sick, I'm just here. And then, a phone goes up in front of my face, and I'm, look, I'm an old man. I hate phones at shows. I don't mind a quick pick. But he was just like, this guy was like, I'm just going to shoot 15 minutes of this. <laughs> and it was just right in front of me. And this is at a Dinosaur Jr. show where everyone is over 40 with their arms crossed like, this is the way Fugazi taught us to watch rock music. <laughs> And so it's like very apparent that this guy is like just the only one with a phone. And I'm like, I should say something to this guy, you know? I'm like, and then I'm like, my mom would say something to this guy. And I'm like, oh great, now I have to go down that hole. Then I'm about to say something to him and he, he puts it down. And I'm like, crisis averted, thank goodness. And I go back to enjoying the show and then Mike Watt comes out on stage with Dinosaur Jr. And I'm like, I don't know if this has ever happened before. This is historical moment. And then that fucking phone goes up again. And I was like, not on my watch. <laughs> and I reached out and I shoved the hand down. And then everything went into slow motion. <laughs> and I was like, oh. That hand feels tinier than it should. And then a woman turned. It was a brand new person who had never done it before. That other guy had left. And she looked at me with rage in her eyes. And she pointed at the stage where Mike Watt was and she said, that's my husband up there. <laughs> and I just went like the, like the camera of my life just immediately like reversed on me. I was no longer like some phone justice warrior like protecting my mom's honor. I was a big drunk bully like shoving a proud wife's hand down. And I was just like, no! And I just deflated completely inside myself until I was just the tip of my own penis. And that <laughs> fell to the ground and then rolled out the door like a little green pea, which I do believe is a book by the fuck pirate Shel Silverstein. <laughs> and I, and I just, I just, I just left and I, and I went into the bathroom and I like locked myself in a stall and I started to have a full on panic attack. Like I felt so bad about this. Like I started hyperventilating and I was like, I have to fix this. I have to fix this. And now looking back on it, I know what was happening. My mom was dying and I had all of these emotions that I had never dealt with before coming up. But now I was placing them on this poor woman whose hand I shoved down momentarily. And like, I couldn't do anything about the fact that my mom was dying, but I could fix this in my mind. And so I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this right. I'm going to make this right. So I run in and I place myself in this like dark hallway that I know she has to walk through in order to get to the green room. <laughs> Guys, hot tip. Don't wait for women you don't know in a dark hallway. Not a good look. <laughs> she comes in 
And I immediately start apologizing. I'm like, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, you don't understand. Like, there was a, a guy before you, and she is so cool about it. She is like, hey, no, I get it. I hate phones that shows too. And because she's being cool about it, I just start ball crying. <laughs> And I was like, but I'm still apologizing? Like, no, 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 I'm apologizing to you. And she's like, what is going on? And then her husband comes off stage, and her husband is not Mike Watt. He's just some fucking saxophonist. And you guys know how I feel about the fucking saxophone. The saxophone is the limp dick of the woodwinds. It even looks like, oh, you cut a limp dick off and dipped it in brass, that's what it looks like. That's what it sounds like if you tried to blow through a limp dick that's been cut off a body, like <laughs> And saxophones don't belong in rock and roll unless it's Bruce Springsteen, a rocket from the crypt, and fuck saxophones! And so now, I'm still crying and apologizing, but also like, saxophone! And I pause for a moment, and I see in their eyes that they are terrified of me. <laughs> and I realize it all at once, and then out loud I just go, abort! And I turn around, <laughs> and I run away. I run out of the venue, and I run into Chinatown in New York City. I run into a park, and I sit on a bench, and I just start crying. I just... I've never in my entire life cried this hard for this long. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it's one of those cries where like, you're, you're crying for so long that you kind of, you use up all of the emotion, but then you're still locked into like the, the, the physical act of crying and your mind starts to wander, where you're just like, I wonder if it'll be nice out tomorrow. And then, I got an idea for a joke, and I was like, ah, 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 that's a good bit. <laughs> I like took a note of it in my phone, and I poured myself into a cab, and I went home. I woke up the next morning, and I was with my mom, and my mom was like, hey, how did uh, how'd it go last night? <laughs> And I didn't want to tell her, like, oh, well, I shoved a proud wife's hand down and embarrassed myself in front of all of my rock idols. <laughs> Instead, I was like, what did I do? I was like, well, uh, I wrote a joke last night. <laughs> and she was like, tell it to me. <laughs> and then I was like, okay. And then I was like, oh, unconscious, please let this be good. <laughs> so I didn't really remember it. Took out my phone. And this was the joke I read to my dying mother. When you're crying, your glasses are like tiny aquariums that are terrible at their job. <laughs> And you have never seen a woman fake laugh <laughs> harder than my mom fake laughed at that joke. And I realized, I, I realized what I wanted to happen in that moment. What I wanted to happen is I wanted, I wanted comedy. This thing that I've dedicated my entire life to, I wanted to, to, to gather up all that sadness and like uh, transform it into this like nugget of pure joy. You know, and instead I got this like nugget of mild chuckles, <laughs> which is so much worse, you know? Like there's no way my mom liked that joke, actually. You can't, it's a bad joke, you know? It's like overly cutesy, kinda doesn't make sense. It's all of my flaws as a stand-up, really, you know? I essentially wrote the saxophone of a joke. <laughs> But she laughed, you know, she laughed. Because it's not about the joke. It's about who's telling it to you. And now that I have two kids, I get that. We found out that my wife was pregnant the day after my mom's funeral. And so I've been trying to be a parent 
without the parent that raised me. And even I, you know, I, I always, you know, try asking my dad, but he's kind of hazy on which of his 18 grandchildren I'm talking about. <laughs> but I'm trying, you know? And recently, my daughter came to me and she said, hey, Papa, do you want to hear my joke? And I said, yeah, I want to hear your joke, baby. And she said, why is six afraid of seven? And I said, why? She said, because seven, eight, nine are going to eat them. <laughs> and at first, I was going to correct her, you know? Like, that's not how the joke goes. Also, it's kind of weird to be stealing material so early. <laughs> but I realized, like, it's a better joke that way. <laughs> like, that, her joke is perfectly stupid. <laughs> and as a comedian, that's what I try and do all the time. I try and make things perfectly stupid. <laughs> and she, my daughter just knocked it out of the park on her first try. And so I laughed. I laughed so hard because I love my daughter's dumb joke the same way my mom loved my dumb joke. Because it's not about the joke. It's about who's telling it to you. And I want my daughter to live in a world full of silliness and absurdity for as long as she possibly can. And, and that is one thing that comedy can do. It can make things perfectly stupid. of mine uh, who just happen to be data scientists, their name are Mark Kanner and Manuel Mai, they decided that they would write me an algorithm that would write jokes for me. <laughs> Essentially, we give it a prompt, and then in a millisecond, it generates 500 jokes. And of those 500 jokes, one, it barely makes sense. <laughs> But it still kind of works, and it's pretty exciting. And so, ladies and gentlemen, would you like to meet the first artificially intelligent comedian, Jokatron? Here he comes, Mr. Jokatron. So. The way we trained Jokatron was that we like fed him hundreds of hours of stand-up, including my stand-up. And the way the algorithm works is you give him a prompt and it will generate the jokes. So the first one we gave it, simple, classic observational comedy, said, have you ever noticed, dot, dot, dot. And so, uh, Jokatron, give me a have you ever noticed. <laughs> have you ever noticed Jesus Christ comes up to here? <laughs> I don't know. That seems like a new area for comedy. I've never, I've never heard Jesus was a shorty before jokes. A 
Again, this was written by an algorithm, okay? And then the next one, we, we, just, we just gave it the word farts, because we're like, always funny, right? Farts, country strong. <laughs> That could be a tagline for an entire hour. <laughs> the farts one were so good, let's give us another farts one, Jokatron. Farts don't feel its own crimes. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, hell, let's get another farts one. Farts. A bathroom applauds on a little milk. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> you weird <laughs> duct tape thing. <laughs> uh, we, get, we were like, well, what are, you know, do you have any dad material, Jokatron? You know, because we got to fit it in the special. Jokatron, give me some dad material. <laughs> Having kids is like, Jim, madam, sit down, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually very true. This is actually the truest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Give me another one, Jokatron. <laughs> Having kids is like David Beckham watching Darth Vader. According to the Democratic Amendment, I've done Sandy Hook Massacre. <laughs> What's going on, Jokatron? You throwing me under the bus here? <laughs> He's getting political. All right, give me one more dad joke, Jokatron. Having kids is like watching the BBC at Sean Penn's Nuts. <laughs> A classic. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jokatron, the first AI comedian. Get out of here, Jokatron. <laughs> That's the way it leaves a room, just backwards. <laughs> So disturbing. It's creepy. It really creeps me out. Thank you very much.